Welcome to The Dinner Table, a discussion with food as a lens into cultures and societies. I'm your host, Fred Opie. What you're about to hear is an author interview with Helen Williams. And the interview uh, is about my most recent publication, Southern Food and Civil Rights, a subtitle, Feeding the Revolution. Uh, The interview allows you to get uh, an insight into not only how you write and research a book like this, but some of the framework I use in my own work as a food writer and historian. It's an exclusive, folks. Southern Food and Civil Rights by me, the author, Frederick Douglass Opie. The book is available at bookstores. You can get on Amazon. I hope you will support independent bookstores. They're out there and they would love to have you come in. Tell them the order, Southern Food and Civil Rights, because they can get it on the shelf quickly. Well, I gather this book grew out of your classes. Well, you know, my process has been I read something or I hear something or see something, it triggers an ideal, mm-hmm. and then I start doing the research. And as the research proves more fruitful, my first step is just to start taking notes, doing archival research, original research, and then I uh, create a series on my blog. Mm-hmm. And I'll do that for sometimes years. In this case, it was years of doing a series called Feed the Revolution. Mm-hmm. And then after I keep building that up, that series, and finding more content, I'll go on archival, you know, kind of a more archival research and start getting more into the document. And once I know I have enough content, I will, uh, I'll either teach the course first with the theme or I'll write the book. Uh, in this case, there were a number of courses in which these things came up. Uh, and then I wrote the book and then decided for for the first time I'll actually teach the course uh, this uh, this coming semester. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's generally my process. It's, uh, but I, I generally like to teach the courses that I write about in one way, shape, or fashion. Or the other thing is, too, just the nature of doing the research and writing. It'll just organically work its way into class discussions where I give examples, and I find that the students, they love those stories, though, what I find in the sources. They're, they're kind of, it's almost like, you know, you listen to comedians mm-hmm. people like Chris Rock, and, and, you know, by the time you hear Chris Rock do one of his routines, he's already been, I, I've heard him describe of a small place, a small club in, in Miami where he goes and he'll work on his stuff and see how it responds. I've heard Steve Harvey do the same thing. He'll tell jokes and he'll look, he'll rate them. There's a one, two, and three, and he's looking for a three response on every one of his jokes. I'm, I'm very similar. I will write stuff. I will talk about stuff and see what has got the, the most interest and potential, and then I, I write a book. So you see that process now in publication. Yeah, I did a story some years back on the uh, supposed disappearance of the Sunday supper, the Sunday family dinners. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, looking back at it and uh, talking to people who still participated in the Sunday family dinner ritual, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I can see a kinship kind of between the concepts that I was dealing with in that story and uh, – what uh, you have presented in in your book. Uh, So you were talking about a process that takes years, and you had mentioned uh, at the beginning of the book that this was a process uh, (laughs) that Mm -hmm. took some years. How many years would you say that it took for this book to come together? I'd say this one, I started writing about this theme four years ago. Okay. You know, it's a blog post. Okay. And, you know, my very first food book is Hog and Hominy, and I did notice when I did the chapter on uh, the Great Migration or things about the sit-ins, I just began to see this whole idea that food sustains movements. And, you know, I, I also lived it. My mother was a uh, NAACP volunteer. She was involved in organizing people also during the whole free death, Nelson Mandela movement. So I saw her 
and what she would do when she was organizing the movement. You know, she would be calling people up, and people would show up at our house, or she'd be going to some place, and I'm, as a little kid, being brought with her. And, you know, the best part about going with her was eating some great food as they talked and chatted out. How closely have you found food to be related to our human experience, especially as far as uh, our history is concerned? How does it shape it? You know, food is one of those things that I think we take for granted, just like oxygen and water. It's, it's essential. And so much of what we do, even if you look at the business world, I work at Bassin College, which is the number one school that teaches entrepreneurship, when, when people think about it, business deals are not cut at the office. They're cut over food. You know, they're cut at lunch and at dinners. So I think food is so important. If I study your food, I can tell you about your region. I can tell you about your family. I can tell you about migration patterns to so where you are. There's so much that food is a lens into. I, I, one, of the, one of the things I do with my students go away on holidays, I say to them, for example, Thanksgiving, I say, when you're sitting around the table, ask the oldest relatives which is the recipe or the dish on the table that best tells our family's history. And, you know, particularly Caucasian students, they have got to a point where many people in this country think if you don't have a skin color, you don't have an ethnic origin. And when they ask about the recipe, they learn a lot about where their family's from. So... Mm-hmm. I think that's the neat thing about food, and also as a, you know, as a teacher, I put food on a title of a course, and they all get excited. And I think you could do the same thing with the words with sports or with a sex term. They get all excited, and what you're really doing is, is you're, like our parents used to do, they put medicine inside something that tastes good to hide the medicine. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how food is when you mm-hmm. eat. It works the same way. Of the history or histories uh, that you gathered for this book, oh, what are maybe one or two things that surprised you the most, you know, as you did your research and you thought, huh? The thing that surprised me the most is what I saw as thematic throughout is that Food can cause a social movement or a strike, and food can sustain a social movement or a strike. Those are two things I noticed, that mm-hmm. if, you, if you mess with people's food, you, you don't cause a problem. And, and if you want to undermine the social movement, you, you somehow eliminate people's access to food. But also, if you want that movement to be victorious, you make sure that you keep the the lines of operation, you know, open so that people get food. So, you know, you can't have a strike unless you can sustain those workers and their families. As long as you sustain the workers and their families, they'll stay off the job. But if you threaten access to their, you know, people who depend on them and their food, then you're going to undermine the strike. But there's a book called The Power of Habits. Well, his name is uh, Charles... Duhigg, and the last name is D-U-H-I-G-G, D-U-H-I-G-G, Charles Duhigg, and it's called The Power of Habits. And I heard him interviewed on the book, and then I got the book I read myself, and I, a fascinating thing that relates to what you just said. Mm-hmm. He was in Iraq, mm-hmm. and he noticed that there kept being these movements and rebellions that would percolate right outside the U.S. Uh, garrison there. And they couldn't they couldn't repress them and keep them from happening. They just kept happening over and over again. So finally, they they found this this officer who developed a bit of an expertise in dealing with rebellions, and they called him in. And the first thing he did is he went down to the the the, the place where this kept happening. And it was kind of like a, a market area where there were a lot of uh, it's just kind of a place that just people kept coming to to buy all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. But that place also had uh, food vendors. And so what was happening is the leaders of these rebellions would come and they would start to gin the people up. And it would be a slow process of getting a speech and kind of getting a collective and telling their stories. And they would tell their stories. And then in a couple hours, 
they get uh, quorum, and they'd have enough to really start some mess. So what the officer did is he said to the mayor of the town, can you get rid of the food vendors? And he said, yeah, I can, I can move them away. And so he removed the food vendors, people that were selling food at this, at this place where these gatherings would happen. And when the rabble houses would come to stir up the crowd, after about two or three hours, people got hungry. And they looked around, and there was no food spot. So they would disperse and go home and eat. And that was the end of the rebellion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, I, and, I, I, and I had seen this in my own, you know, my own studies, how strikes were able to continue over long periods of time because they had support of other unions and sympathizers that will provide food. So I just started putting two and two together. Mm-hmm. And, and it's true. Uh, Im- imagine a sporting event. You know, if, if you have a, whether it be a baseball game or a soccer game or whatever, and you got big football territory you are. Imagine, imagine if the Razorbacks had a game against Tennessee. If Tennessee really wanted to win that game, they wouldn't have to steal the play. All they have to do is get the Gatorade barrels off the sideline. Mm-hmm. And Tennessee don't win that game. Because <laughs> the Razorback, if they can't hydrate, that's the end of it. It's, they're just gone. So food mm-hmm. and water are just so essential to so much of our lives that we don't think about it. Mm-hmm. Hmm. You know, as we're talking, I was just thinking about the New Testament and thinking, you know, what if... Uh, uh, Jesus hadn't taken those uh, the five loaves of bread and two fish and fed those uh, five thousand something people. Uh, <laughs> some of the uh, people who went on to become movers and shakers of the faith uh, might not have been <laughs> because Absolutely. they were hungry. Yeah, you know? and think about the number of parables in the Old and New Testament that revolve around food. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because people get that, people understand that, and it's a with which you could talk to people. Gandhi's strength developed around his decision to fast. Mm-hmm. And, and and how that broke, you know, the the colonial power and just the power of fasting. Think about his his very first movement was a movement uh to produce their own salt. And they used the salt to preserve their food and the British wanted to control that trade because he knew how essential it was to the people. One of his first movements was a salt, a salt march. Uh-huh. The French Revolution, people don't realize. The mm-hmm. French Revolution was kicked off by uh, food rights. So, the, you know, these are things that I've seen. If, even if you look at the uh, Jasmine Revolution that happened a couple of years back in Egypt, or the, that, uh, that movement, entire square, was sustained because people had food. And they were getting food. First of all, the movement... The, the movement against Jose and the Barak started because his regime cut subsidies to food. That's that's one of the first things that sparked that riot that people seem to forget. Mm-hmm. And then the the uh, the movement sustained itself into Air Square because people were bringing in food. One of the stories that I found out in the process, if you, if you look at the uh, the conclusion to the book, there's an afterword where I talk about. Uh, Occupy Wall Street. I went there and I interviewed the people there, and they 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 developed a concept from Tahrir Square, which is they went to a local uh, police uh, pizza shop in in New York, and they set up a place where if you wanted to contribute to to Occupy Wall Street, you could you could just call the pizza shop and you could order a pizza, and pay for it with your debit card or credit card, and then they, the pizza shop would bring it to Occupy Wall Street. They got that idea from be moving in Egypt. That's where they got the idea. Mm. Wow. I tell students first day of class, come to class with food if you want. I often will bring food to class mm-hmm. uh, as a way of developing intimacy, unity, and keep them on track because it's pretty hard to talk about the stuff and then not really eat anything. Right. What I realized in my very first book that when you're researching and writing this stuff, if you're at home, you are going to just naturally gravitate towards the kitchen and you start cooking these recipes and doing stuff that you don't even realize you're doing it. You know, you're sitting there talking about, you know, cornbread or this or that, you know, in a story of somebody mention of what people bought to the march and mm-hmm. that thing you know, subconsciously you're you want to eat that. Right. I don't work at home. I always work away from the house. Right. That's <laughs> Oh, a good practice. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, that'd be thick as a house. 
We'll be right back. For more interviews and related content, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and other podcast distributors. Also, check out our website at www.fredopi.com. Ask questions on Facebook at Frederick Douglass Opie and on Twitter at Dr. Fred D. Opie. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at fdopie at gmail.com. That's fdopie at gmail.com. Hey folks, if you're enjoying hearing Fred talk about some of his techniques for researching and writing books, there's another podcast you might like on the Fred Opie show page. Fred speaks to graduate students at Boston University and gives some tips on writing books people love. Here's a short clip from that episode, which is available on SoundCloud, iTunes, or Stitcher, wherever you listen to The Fred Opie Show. My editors who work with me, people who work for me and not for a press, to edit the book in two ways. Number one, continue to teach me how to get rid of professor talk. Again, it's a lot of that esoteric language. Now, there are those who, that's just naturally how they talk. That's not me. So I had to learn how to speak like that because of my insecurity. But then when I, after I got out of school and I began to write, I said, I don't want that in there because it's not going to make my work accessible to as many people as I want to. So one of the things I tell my editors is teach me how to get rid of professor talk. That's one thing. Secondly, I say to them, I want all my work to be written so that my seventh grade son is, is accessible to him. And I also want it to be interesting and intriguing for students at your old level. If you're reading it, but I haven't convinced the seventh grader to read it yet. So we're still, work, we're still working on that part. Now back to the show. What not so well known facts that were in this book do you believe will intrigue or has intrigued readers the most? The role that everyday people have played in some of these most significant movements, uh, I'll use the example of the Montgomery bus boycott. In order for the Montgomery Improvement Association to keep people off the bus, they had to provide cars and carpools so people could get to work inexpensively. Well, the insurance, the gas, all those things necessary to keep that carpool going mm -hmm. came, much of it came from women on both sides of Montgomery who baked goods and sold the goods and didn't tell people why they were selling the goods. But just, they just thought people were making extra money, but they were selling these goods and then giving the proceeds to the movement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the idea that it's not always the leaders, the Dr. King's, the strong and the powerful who are reasons why movement is successful. It's the contributions of everybody. And that no matter who you are, there's something that you can do. You know, the Ecclesiastes says, whatever you whatever you find your whatever you find your hands to do, do. And one of the things that you see is that there are people who use those resources. I'm not I may not be an eloquent speaker, I may not be an eloquent uh singer. But there's something I can do, and for many people, it's, it's cooking. You know, I, I'm also thinking as, as we're discussing this right now, what do people do when someone dies in the community? Oh, they my take, God. They yeah. take it this and you bring it over to them. Because you know that when you're grieving, you don't have the energy to prepare the food. Mm -hmm. You know, when a newborn is, comes to a house, people bring, bake a dish and bring it over. And they keep doing it because they understand when you, when you just had a child, and you are the one who makes the meals, you're going to be out of commission for a while. So, you know, just what you can contribute to, to something in some way, mm -hmm. how important that is. It doesn't have to be an eloquent speech. It doesn't have to even, you may not even stand on the, on the, uh, on the ticket line, but there's something you can do. That's one of the things I learned. You know, and one of the things that I also learned over the years is the first book, Hog and Harmony, mm -hmm. it was a history of African American food culture, but I had no recipes. And when I went, went out and did the book tour, more than one time people would raise their hand and say, well, why don't you have recipes? And so all the books I've done since then, I have included recipes. There's a book that, that's called The Upset in the Apple Cart, which was social movements, and that's the first time I started really pointing in on this with all the food flakes and 
flavor strikes and stuff. And then that one, I had recipes, but they weren't original recipes from the time period. They just kind of got recipes off the, mm-hmm. of the Internet. Then after that, the last two books, the Zorno Hurston book and this one, I specifically made sure I had time period recipes. So if it's a move in Alabama, it was as close as I could in it, to a recipe from Alabama or a border state, and then from the same time period, which I think is really cool. And, and I, cook, I cook from the majority of these recipes. So I, I've done them, and I know they work. Sometimes, like, for example, if, if you look on my blog today, I did a, a recipe, a cake recipe, mm-hmm. and the recipe called for PAT milk, pet milk, uh-huh. which, which is an evaporated milk. But I grew up never even heard of that evaporated mm-hmm. milk. So I, I had to look it up today, but I found it interesting. So the food writer that did this recipe Obviously, there was some advertising involved for the food column. So they used certain products, and they, they used them by name. Just so we talk about product placement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Product placement was something that I've seen in a lot of these food columns. I, I would love to, at some point, I'll, I'll do this and start blocking on African-American food writers that were with the African-American uh, newspapers. There were so many these people that nobody really has given – kind of notoriety to, and, and mm-hmm. I, I'm assuming that they were well-known by their readers, but since the mm-hmm. newspapers have gone out of business, not right. well known. So these are really interesting writers, great recipes, and great little anecdotes. So that's, that's another thing that I'd like to possibly do a book on those. Mm-hmm. And then, no, that that would be very good. I grew up on pet milk. You know, I know pet milk, but uh, you're right. It, 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 you're in an, another region or in another time, you're going to be like, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, for us, where I grew up uh, in New York, and both my grandparents, one's from North Carolina, the other one's from Virginia, they always used the carnation can evaporated milk. So I've never seen pet milk mm-hmm. company. So I, I got to kick out of it. I, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm probably pretty nerdy like this, but when I see little things like that, I, you know, I kind of fixate on them and try to share. I figure if it's new to me, it's got to be new to some of my readers. Oh, yes, definitely. Pet milk was just so prolific that uh, I think I must have thought, I probably thought it was the type of <laughs> milk, <laughs> not evaporated milk. No, it's pet milk, you know. So. As far as research, <laughs> I had a uh, a fellowship at Harvard in 2013, and with that fellowship came library privileges. And Harvard has mm. access to what they call the ProCraft Historical Newspaper. So I was able to pull up. I could I could type in the word fried chicken, mm-hmm. and I could I could pull up sources from newspapers. And, I, and after a while, I knew which ones I wanted, and I could pull up stuff from the 1880s all the way up until current time. So I did not have to travel to look for different newspapers. I could just follow up that way. I also found that there are a lot of books that uh, the actual book has been made into PDFs or word or word books, and they're online. So mm-hmm. through Harvard, I had access to a lot of stuff. Now, and there's other things where just over a period of time, you know, I just I had to kind of travel around. But fortunately, I'm also one of these people as a researcher that when I go out and do research, if I see anything related to a topic I might have future interest in, I just take photos or or I'll take notes. And so I have I have a lot of material on my computer, mm-hmm. particularly from the WPA period in the 1930s Great Depression. I, I have stuff that I'm just slowly going through. Uh, transcribing it and producing it in blog form. But I have a lot of material. I think sometimes you can get to a point where you're doing more research than you are writing, and, and I have I have a ton of stuff. I don't need to do more research. I just need to just keep cranking it out in books. And, and, and you know, I think some people, whether it be friends or, or, or colleagues at other institutions, and some at my own schools, they're like, you know, how are you producing a book? Every two years, <laughs> it's because I did the legwork. Mm-hmm. Now it's just it's just doing good writing. I have, I have a process that I explain to you, and I just work that process. 
Well, here comes the part about the favorite recipes. Uh, did you find any that you gravitated toward more than the others? Well, you know, I got two kids, and you do the asking which kid do I like the most. <laughs> it's not fair. I can I can tell you my tendencies and my kind of score of super pie. Mm-hmm. So I I would say that those would be pie recipes. I'm not a big cake person, so I love pies. Mm-hmm. So you know, those are some of my favorites. I also love biscuits. I just think biscuits are the most universal thing. You can do so much with biscuits, whether it be dinner, breakfast, or something like that. So I, I, I would say to the readers, check out the biscuit recipes, check out the uh, pie recipes, and then I also have a uh, proclivity towards uh, fried chicken. It's just ubiquitous throughout the South, and everybody, you know, fried chicken is a lot like rice in the Caribbean. Rice in the mm-hmm. Caribbean, everybody does the rice and beans dish, and they all think they do the best one. The same thing with fried chicken. Anybody in the South does it, everybody thinks they do it better than anybody else. There's often talk about how the things we actually lost of the integration sense of communities, you know, as people moved away, and then the city just barged through our old neighborhoods with freeways and et cetera, et cetera. I wondered yeah. if you thought that also might have been reflected in our food. And There's one thing about segregation is it forced people to be together in communities and support each other's businesses mm-hmm. uh, out of necessity. I mean, if, if people are treating you terribly, you don't want to go to business there. And so a lot of the restaurant and eateries uh, that we once had are gone because people have options. And that's one thing that money and political freedom does it give you options. And the negative part of that is you have institutions that are no longer in, fo- in place. The other thing, too, though, <laughs> the loss of some of these places has a lot to do with social mobility within the African American community. And I'll give you an example of restaurants where these were mom and pop restaurants that uh, over the years went from uh, Dookie Chases, I think it's, it's a representative of this. They started off as kind of uh, corner snack bars or things like that, you know, kind of street food. Then they go to brick and mortar, and then they don't pass on to the next generation. Mm-hmm. And I see this in a number of places that your mom and dad or grandparents work real hard to build the business, but they built the business to provide what's necessary to educate the kids and give them the education that they could Mm-hmm. So, so now that my daughter or my granddaughter or doctors and lawyers or all those type of professionals or writers, mm-hmm. uh, they don't want them coming back and working in the family business. And they they spurn them from doing that. So after the business is flourishing, the people get too old to keep operating them, and then they either close them down or sell them to somebody else. So there, there's no... There's no transition or legacy developed into the family businesses. This is the same with a lot of things, but I I hear this more often with the food places. Mm -hmm. I work too hard for you to come and do this stuff. I want you Mm -hmm. to do better. Mm -hmm. The ideal of working in the food business is not seen as moving up or moving forward. It's seen as staying back. Ah. That's that's a common theme I've seen. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, you're right, and it's not only in the black community. I was talking to oh, yeah. my Vietnamese boat person, nail tech, and mm-hmm. I said, there's not going to be anybody to do our deal there in a few years, is there? He said, I don't think there will be because they do not want their children to be nail techs. They want them all to be doctors, as I'm sure you uh, well know. They yeah. insist that they're going to be doctors and dentists and et cetera, et cetera, and they definitely don't want their their children to do nails. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's. I think that's. It's an issue of social mobility. I, mm-hmm. There's just a lot of things that, as I continue to do research and writing, there are a lot of things that I thought were uh, ethnic aligned. You know, like this is an African American thing, or this is an Asian thing, or this is a Jewish thing. And more of it, I realize, is a regional thing. There are regional differences and there are economic differences. So some of, like, like one of the things that my mother-in-law would fight me on was my my whole ideal that uh, I don't think there's a lot of difference between uh, what African-Americans and 
the South and, and white Americans shall eat simply because if, if you're white and you have a lot of money, you had a black person cook the boy. If you were poor and you were white, you were usually in pretty close quarters with either black neighbors or coworkers, and you in the meetings a lot, you know. So there's a lot of sharing that goes back and forth. And at what point can you say this is no longer a recipe you got from somebody else? There's so much sharing that goes on with good cooks. Yes. And I, and I know people don't, particularly black folks, I think we have had so much of our intellectual capital, capital ripped off from us that we don't want to admit how much we have in common with right. folks, whether, whether it was shared or whether it was taken. There's a lot more commonality than we want to admit. To check out our podcast archive, suggest show topics, and advertise on the show, and to book me as a guest and or speaker, visit our website, www.fredopi.com. That's www.fredopi.com. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at fdopie at gmail.com. That's fdopie at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and be good.